Welcome everyone. Okay. Um, hopefully we can share our screens. Yeah, I think so. Um, okay. Hi everybody. Thanks for being here today. Um, my name is Jackie Mellinger. I'm from a company called My Personal Bookkeeper and I'll tell you a little bit more uh, when it's my turn to speak, but this is Lisa Joy Rosing of The Joy of Downsizing, and she's going to begin our presentation. Great. So um, I am going to see if I can share my screen. Can you? I just, yeah. I think so. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. The Zoom screen, though. I did. Thank you. And here we go. Do the slides. Okay. Hey, so um, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Lisa Joy Rosing, and the company that I own is called Joy of Downsizing. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about downsizing, right sizing, decluttering, and I'm going to go over a variety of different types of disorganization, but also talking about downsizing for a move. And I'm going to go ahead and um, just give you a little bit of my background. I am a downsizing consultant, a professional organizer. I am an interior designer and a senior and specialty move manager. Okay, so at Joy of Downsizing, our goal is to help adults 55 plus make decisions on downsizing a lifetime of belongings and right sizing and aging in place or to manage a transition into a new home. There are two types of downsizing. So obviously, if you're not moving, I call downsizing uh, for, for when you're aging in place or when you're staying in your home, right sizing. Because oftentimes we collect a lifetime of belongings and we have too much. And so I can come in and work with people on the right amount of items that they should have in their home. But obviously, the typical downsizing that you hear about is when someone is going from a larger home to a smaller home, and then we have a whole different plan in place. So uh, the definition of right sizing. Right sizing is when you downsize until there is the right amount of items in your home. And a very quick definition of what situational disorganization means is that as a professional organizer, I can work with someone who's having trouble getting back on track. Let's say something happens unexpectedly. Maybe they were recently in the hospital, they were injured, maybe they, they had a divorce, um, whatever it may be, they fall behind. People will often fall behind on filing, on laundry, dishes. And sometimes people just get right back on track themselves but sometimes they do need some temporary support. And when this unexpected event begins to overwhelm and, and your disorganization doesn't improve or worsen, that is when it's called situational disorganization. And a professional organizer that specializes in right-sizing and downsizing may help in that situation get you back on track. So in this type of, um, in this type of organizing, it's not usually ongoing. Once we get once we get back on track, then the uh, client usually doesn't need more support. Uh, but let's talk about chronic disorganization. Um, chronic disorganization persists over a long period of time. I've had clients that were artists, academics, lawyers, where they just all their lives, they've always had um, some form of disorganization. And it can undermine the quality of life. It can reoccur despite self-help attempts, and it can be present obviously with aging and brain-based challenges. So whether you have had ADHD undiagnosed or diagnosed, um, 
aging and physical limitations, injury. Some people that I've worked with have had a stroke and they're recovering. Uh, maybe they have anxiety or depression, hoarding disorder, post-traumatic stress, past trauma, and very commonly early memory loss or MCI, which is called mild cognitive impairment. And then as early dementia sets in, those are all ways in which chronic disorganization can show up, even if it wasn't always with you. And what does it look like at home when you're chronically disorganized? Well, you have cluttering, cluttered living areas. Your storage areas may be filled to capacity. You have multiple calendars, or maybe you're not keeping a calendar regularly. You have a stressful household environment. Maybe you're missing important household documents. You're often late leaving for appointments because you've misplaced something or you're distracted. Um, you have difficulty completing household tasks like laundry, house cleaning, filing. Uh, you have multiple projects started but not finished. And again, the inability to find things when you need them. Some people with chronic disorganization will have rented ex additional storage units because they have so many possessions. It, it's easier to know that they can get them again, so they'll store them, which I am actually really opposed to because that can add up. I had a client that spent $300 a month and in 10 years, I mean, that was like $36,000 and she was never going to use anything in that storage unit ever again. So, you know, that was, that was a big wake up call that, Hey, you know, why are we saving this? Let's, let's take some time and invest in a little downsizing, and get rid of those things so that you don't have to keep paying that every month. Um, and I do want to say something about multiple calendars. Um, I once had a client who was nervous about when she was going to have another appointment with me. And she called me and we had written down on her paper calendar when we were together, our appointment, but she was on her computer calendar. And I don't know if it was an iCalendar or a Google calendar, but she signed in to her, her computer and she didn't see any appointments. And she called me frantically and I said, no, 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 we, you put it on your, on your calendar that's on the wall in your office. And then she went there and she's like, oh my goodness. So we, we really had to address the, you know, multiple calendars. I do want to quickly talk about hoarding disorder because hoarding disorder is different. Um, hoarding, you know, just think about this. Many people live with clutter, but it, their, their home is safe to move around in. They can straighten up enough to feel at ease and to have guests over. The rooms that the rooms that they have are used in the way they're meant to. There's no piles in their shower, et cetera. Um, but when clutter affects daily life, when it is filling up a bed, filling up your bathtub, sometimes people put things in their oven, their dishwasher, um, all around their bedroom, covering up their sofa, when they're not able to use those items, those, those, um, you know, those pieces of fur for their, for their, for the use that they were intended for, that is um, when we start to question whether there is some hoarding disorder. They're buying many of the same items sometimes because they can't find them. Um, maybe they have a shopping addiction where they save things like newspaper, ketchup packets, little soy sauce packets, um, and does clutter prevent entertaining? So if you're embarrassed and you don't want people to come over, are there, are there narrow pathways to walk between rooms? And oftentimes this is um, a good signal that um, you might need some support because that's not safe. And I'll do some pictures in a minute. But I do want to say something about hoarding disorder. It's not always like the shows, right? You might have you might have a touch of hoarding disorder, but not be severe. Um, and in 2013, hoarding disorder was named as a distinct mental illness on the on the DSM-5. It's a form of obsessive compulsive disorder, and two people two percent of people have this disorder. And quickly look at this this little chart here. It is called the Clutter Image Rating Scale, and I use this oftentimes to address clutter with my clients. So if you're looking at this and you see the number three, 
Um, three is a borderline number for me. I feel like you're chronically disorganized at three, but as you start to move towards four, where you're not able to really sleep in your bed and use your room as its, its function, um, that's starting to be a, a, a clue that maybe more is going on. And so I would say a level four and higher does fit that hoarding disorder uh, scale. Um, the photo you're looking at on the left is somebody who is chronically disorganized, and you can see that it it did start to take on close to, uh, you know, a three or a four on that scale I just showed you, but with support, um, we were able to fairly quickly um, take back their space, and I think that's really one of the great things about working with a downsizing consultant. Um, this was a client that was hoarding. Um, on the picture on your left, you'll notice I couldn't get my cart. There's a little red cart by the front door. I couldn't get it through the hallway safely. Um, and this particular client used a walker. And it was really dangerous because I was very concerned that items high up could fall on them. Um, and again, this is more of their home on the right-hand side. This is somebody who was situationally disorganized. They had um, young, they had young children, and they just, um, you know, life made them busy, and they ended up just getting. Well, there maybe some of their rooms appear to have some chronic disorganization, but they called in support, and we were able to get their space cleared. Um, and I just wanna show you sometimes just working with a professional organizer is, is easy. Like you look at the photo on the left of the same closet as on the right. And basically um, this was about a four to five hour project and it really allowed us to make some good decisions and be able to take back that space. And I use that a lot, take back your space. Um, they felt so much better when they were able to have their coats and their items that were their favorites. Um, it's not so much that it's organized, it's that we downsized and got rid of stuff that they maybe weren't using and they need. And now we're able to really use and see everything in their home. Um, I'm gonna show you a picture. If I just walked into a house and the entire house looked like this photo, I would say that that person had some hoarding disorder. Um, However, this was their basement and the rest of the home was a little disorganized, but they tended to use their basement as a storage unit. So you notice that you can sometimes have a space when you're not really hoarding, but you do, you're starting to have a problem where you're starting to save so much stuff that um, would be good to have a, have a project, a downsizing project. This photo is a photo of somebody who uh, did some homework after a session and a, and a discussion um, where they literally had a beautiful collection of all of these different teapots. And the collection was pretty cluttered. And I mentioned to them as homework, I think the right thing to do would be to go through one by one and make some decisions on even if you like it, is it the most special? Is it the most important? Do you need it? And wouldn't it be nice if somebody else could benefit from a teapot, um, from your teapot collection, if it's not as special to you? And um, they text me a photo um, after our session, and this is the photo. They got rid of 17 teapots. So I'm a big believer in um, motivating my clients to do this on their own as well. Um, age in place and decluttering support. So you know you need some decluttering support if you're unsure of how to begin right-sizing. Um, you have items in your home that you no longer need, such as uh, I was talking before this started with one of the guys on the call and he said he had some toys that were from, yeah, you, you have to make those decisions. If you're not using them anymore and they're taking up space, um, you can make arrangements, you can list them for sale, you can donate them, you can gift them. I'm a big fan of gifting. So if you're unsure of how to begin right-sizing, you wanna learn some organizing systems and techniques, you have a deadline, 
For completing a project, such as a move or a family visit, you need the expertise of someone who has, who has helped people with chronic disorganization or hoarding disorder. You, you would benefit from ongoing organizing maintenance. Um, you need help to remove a large quantity of objects or you want the objectivity of a neutral third party. If you know that you fit in that any of those categories apply to you, then you could use the assistance of a professional organizer who has downsizing and right-sizing specialty. Um, and I do wanna switch gears now because um, in addition to right-sizing, um, I do focus a lot on downsizing when somebody is actually moving. And so I want to quickly talk about some move management. And obviously, you don't have to be moving to start the downsizing process, because the earlier you start, the happier you will be. So seniors and their families are often overwhelmed thinking about downsizing and moving. They're unsure of how to start. They don't know what will fit. They don't know what to keep. It can be very stressful to move alone. Moving is physical. It's different than when they moved 20 years ago. Um, and they don't want to burden their family because a lot of times their family have busy lives and they don't want to become a burden to them. And clearly, it's really nice to be able to independently hire, hire people to help and assist you. And it does maintain your independence. So what do we do? Uh, Joy of Downsizing does both downsizing and right-sizing. If you're moving, we'll make you a customized move plan. If you are moving, we, and it's a smaller space, we will evaluate what fits in the new home. Uh, we'll do downsizing appointments where we're actually in there. And the, the uh, gentleman on your left is downsizing. He had three sets of silverware and he was moving into senior living. And we were uh, downsizing down to one set of silverware, which is always nice. Um, and so we do pack day and move day coordination. Um, unpacking and setting up, I have a team of people. I have over 10 people that work for my company on a part-time basis. And we, uh, I will schedule them for an unpack where we walk in the door and we, the very day the boxes are moved into the new home, we are there unpacking. We are putting everything away um, and setting up the new home so it looks like you always live there. Um, and then, of course, we do organizing, decluttering, home cleanout coordination, and stress free relocation. Part of our moving uh, process is that we do a step by step move plan. It is customized to you, it is very organized and expert. When I talk about evaluation for fit, this is a client of mine. Um, we were doing a walkthrough of a new uh, apartment that she was gonna move into. Um, I had measured all of the furniture that she wanted to take um, to see if it would fit in the new apartment. We, we only took what fit. And when we talk about right sizing for the new space, um, we were really focused on she's not tall. And we were very focused on what items she needed on a daily basis. And notice the limited amount of cabinet space we had. She could use the, the first two shelves of the upper cabinet. The, um, and she was pretty okay to use the bottom shelves, but we do take that, it's very customized. We take whatever your physical limitation is, we take that into consideration. If you can't reach high enough, we're gonna wanna put something up there that you might only use on the top shelf once a year. So um, we very much customize. Um, and we do a, for, a floor plan, which is a furniture plan. We decide the placement, we measure your new home. And if you have large items, if you're coming from a large home in a small home, we will, um, we will discuss getting some smaller items or missing items that you need for the new space. Um, and so I do want to talk about that downsizing process. It is about gifting, donating, offering for free. Um, you know, you can do some selling, but don't let the selling be an obstacle because sometimes if you feel like you need to earn money on the items that you've used, 
um, that can become an obstacle to getting rid of them. So I love when people feel ready to just part with them and we can make a great plan for them. So this is a uh, this was a move day of a client. You'll notice she's packed and ready. And there I am greeting the moving company as they're arriving for the day. I have a special way that I like the truck to be loaded. It might be different than the way a typical moving company would load the truck, but I am keeping uh, your process in mind as I am coordinating that, that um, pack and move day. This on, the photo on the right is my client um, who moved from a, a large, large condo into a small senior living building. And what's amazing is we kept his design very similar and his home really feels like home because we were able to capture by downsizing enough of the items that we didn't move them with him, but that we were able to take the same flavor, the same style and recreate it in a smaller space. And um, he, it, it was a very big success. Uh, he had a beautiful art collection and we were able to really recapture his home. Um, again, we do professional organizing, right-sizing, decluttering, maintenance, and post-move organizing. Um, and ask for help. Don't do it yourself. It is such a treat to have other people in there. There's three of my team members unpacking a client in Northbrook. Um, she had just moved, and we really, um, we really, really enjoy helping our clients so that they can walk into a space and have it all set up for them. Uh, if you work with us, we will make you referrals if you are interested. We know and work with people all the time. I love the moving companies that I'm affiliated with. I, they're amazing. I don't work with companies that don't show up or break things. I work with the best. Um, I have clean out companies, estate sale companies that I will bring in. I have uh, senior housing specialists, should you not have a place to live. I know daily money managers, such as Jackie Mellinger, who is the one who has invited me to speak today for you. Um, and I know real estate agents, repairmen, painters, cleaners, therapists, senior programs. If I don't, if I don't have it listed and I'm working with you and you you want a referral, ask. I know many people. Um, and quickly, I'll tell you that Joy of Downsizing, I am a member of both NAPO, the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals, and of NASM, the National Association of Senior and Specialty Move Managers. Um, and I am also on the Chicagoland Hoarding Task Force. So that is it. Um, I know that we're going to have some time for questions. Um, and uh, but I please take down my contact information if you know anybody who needs to downsize, if you yourself need to downsize or declutter. Um, I do think that um, it can be fun when you have the right support and make, I love to help make downsizing a joy. Um, so Jackie, will we be doing questions now or at the end after you? Maybe let's just do them at the end all together. That sounds great. So thank you for listening. Can you stop your share? I am, yes. Okay. Yeah, let's go. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay, here we go. So I am gonna talk about organizing your financial life. A little bit different than uh, your thing, your items. So just to give you a quick uh, view on who I am and what I do, I uh, am a co-owner with my husband of my personal bookkeeper since 2018. And we have also been uh, owning and managing a caregiving company called Homestead since 2001. My prior life, I was doing nursing home admissions and I was a licensed nursing home administrator. And in my spare time, um, I, like to give back by helping out in my synagogue as a VP of development and senior life chairperson for the congregation. 
about my personal bookkeeper. Um, we provide our clients with help in their household and financial affairs. And our most requested services are helping them to set up, helping our clients to set up bill pay, make sure nothing gets paid late, make sure they don't lose any bills, um, helping to get organized for the accountant at tax time. If you've ever had a procedure done, you're going to get a ton of mail from the hospital, the anesthesiologist, the doctor, Medicare, your insurance, and so on. So we can help you to go through all of that. We assist in mail review, helping people to just go through their mail and discern what's junk and what's important. Um, we can help you with filing, which is really no fun. So we try to help people set up a good filing system, whether it's hard copy in a file cabinet or setting you up digitally. And when we begin service, we always come out and meet with a person either in person or on Zoom. Um, and it's no obligation, there's no cost for it. So I am gonna talk to you today about how to keep your records, tracking your expenses and income, um, making sure your bills will be paid on time, as I said, using your calendar as a tool. Uh, password management is very important and preparing for an emergency. So first, what are some signs of financial disorganization? Um, you know, if you go to someone's home and you see that they have piles of unopened mail laying around, and as Lisa was showing you hoarding, we see paper hoarding. Sometimes we see that a person can't eat at their table because it's covered in paper, or they have piles of paper on their bed because they try to go through it when they're falling asleep at night. That's a sign that something is, is not right there. Um, if somebody is getting a lot of late notices or they're accruing late fees on their bills, on their credit cards, uh, that is something that needs to get changed. And if they're unable to find documents at tax time, they can't come up with the documents for the accountant or if an attorney asks for something, that's a sign. Um, sometimes we find people who have checks laying around that they never cashed. Uh, you might be, you know, have somebody that you wrote a check to and they never cashed it. That could be a sign that they're financially disorganized. If they are bouncing their own checks, they're making payments and they don't have the money in the accounts, they're not keeping track. Um, when somebody is unable to meet their regular expenses, even though they have a very good income, it means they are not planning accordingly. And if somebody is getting, we all get fraud on our credit cards once in a while, but if it keeps happening over and over again, it means you are not uh, doing what you need to do to take care of it. And then uh, just even unexpected charges on the credit card. So how do people become financially disorganized? It's easy for that to happen. We all find ourselves very busy and there's just not enough time in the day. We can be busy with work or activities and family and uh, you know, it just becomes too hard. I hear from a lot of people that by the time they've worked all day and taken care of their kids and put them to bed, the last thing they wanna do is sit down and work on bills. Um, the aging process, even if people don't have cognitive decline, sometimes we just slow down a little bit. Um, we may not, be so good with technology and so much is done online now um, that that can make it hard to keep up. And a lot of people just have a lack of financial knowledge, which causes us to fear dealing with it, or we might just not be interested in it. Unfortunately, they don't teach a lot of finance in school unless you major in that. So um, we're not all equipped to take care of these things. And as Lisa talked about, you might have an illness or a hospitalization that just sets you back. And once you come home now, it's really daunting um, going through all that mail and figuring out what to do with it. And you just kind of don't want to get started. Some people could have learning disabilities, whether they're diagnosed or undiagnosed. And the, sometimes those get worse as we get older um, or an executive functioning deficit where we just aren't good at organizing and getting started. And when there's a big project, it's very hard to break it down. I think failing to set goals and to make a plan can really set you back and keep you from doing what you need to do. And then seek, failing to seek professional advice. Like, as I said, we're not experts. Most people don't know um, what to do in certain situations. So having an accountant that you trust and can talk to is really important or a financial advisor who will instruct you 
or an attorney who can help. It's really important to have that all those things in your life or a bookkeeper who can come in and help you. So some skills to help you organize and to manage your time. Uh, using your calendar as a tool is a great idea. The, ne the next point is keeping a to-do list. And many of us keep to-do lists, but just having something on your to-do list doesn't mean that you've actually planned to get that done. So as you see in this picture, this person's calendar is really color coded. Um, I would think that that's somebody who plans out her time and puts, you know, maybe that blue space is time for sitting at her desk and going through her mail and, and maybe, you know, sets time for checking email. Email can really distract us as it, you check it as it comes in all day. So I try to schedule it into my day only to check it. You know, I have it in my calendar to check it every morning. Uh, sometime midday and then again in the afternoon and I try to ignore it in between. Most things that come in an email can wait those few hours and aren't so urgent. Um, same thing with checking your bank balances and knowing what's going on. I actually have reminders in my calendar for that too to check my bank balance every couple of days. It's good to have a spot in your home. You know, the kitchen counter often ends up being where we throw our mail and that's just not a good place for it. So if you can make a spot off to the side or if you have a desk that you put a basket or a standing uh, mail holder that has file folders it's just a good way to put your mail in there and work on it when you need to but at least it's not cluttering up your house and as I talk about when we go through our mail it's important to really just quickly discard the junk mail so every day when my mail comes in I have a slot in my front door it hits the floor and I pick it up and I immediately just, without spending much time on it, I know these things are like coupon magazines and junk. They go directly into my recycling bin and the other pieces go into my mail holder for me to look at later. Um, and the same thing with email. It's really good to delete your junk mail on a regular basis. I try to do it every day. And if you can go through, if something is junk and you don't wanna keep receiving this email, Scroll all the way to the bottom and find where it says unsubscribe and get rid of it so you won't be getting it again because that email box can get so cluttered and before you know it, you haven't looked for a few days, you have hundreds of emails. Um, and eliminate distractions, like close your email out when you're trying to work on something, um, put your phone on, do not disturb so that you can concentrate. Uh, how often do you review mail? So, you know, it's different for everyone what works for you, but do you do it every day or every few days? Do you, there are people who don't go through their mail often and they just let it pile up. And um, I, you know, always heard of the, the, there's, you know, a family member who never responds to an invitation. And she, when we ask her, how come you haven't responded? Are you coming? She'll go back and look through her mail and find it. You need to look through your mail more often than that. Um, it doesn't have to be every day, but as I said, if you can discard the junk, it'll save you time. And then you put the important stuff in your holder and go through it every couple days. Some people want to do it every day. Um, and it's great if you can set up files. You don't have to necessarily pay your bills on a daily basis, but make a folder for bills, make a folder for, do for donations, maybe a, like a tickler file of things to come back to and review. And certainly you should have a tax file where you're putting documents that you'll need to get to your accountant eventually. Um, you should cut down on how many times you look at your documents. You wanna make sure that you set a time to sit down and actually go through them. So maybe once a week, you're gonna just sit down and pay your bills and look at what you need to do. I also recommend that you move to electronic delivery of your bills as much as possible because things get lost in the mail. And also, wouldn't it be great to have less of that junk coming in your door and having to go through it and sit on your um, table or your desk? If it comes through email, you get the chance to check it. It's kind of a good way to just keep it there filed. And you can make folders in your email box to file things. And if you can set things up on auto pay. Next thing we're going to talk about is bill pay. Um, you know, that helps you too. So 
It's in order to be really organized about your bills and your expenses, you should make a list of your regular bills, whether you can do it in a spreadsheet or you just want it on a piece of paper somewhere, but you know, organize them by your monthly bills, your utilities, things that come to you quarterly, and then things like life insurance or, or something else that is an annual bill. Um, and that way you can kind of go back and check it off every month and make sure you didn't miss anything. Um, as I was saying, get things electronically, keep them in folders. Um, you can make folders on your computer or just in your email box for different things. It's so easy to find that way. And if you put them on auto pay, you still can check your bills over and you can still call the company to say something was wrong with the bill, but at least you're not missing a payment. You're not having a late fee. You're not worrying about having something turned off because you didn't pay it. Um, keeping a spreadsheet or some type, of, some type of list using a financial management software to track your expenses and your income and create a budget. You know, some of us need a budget. Some of us are not so worried, um, but it's important for everyone to have a handle on what they spend in a month and how much money needs to go into your regular banking account to cover those expenses. Uh, we were talking last night with some of the people who work for my personal bookkeeper and one person said she did an expense tracking and let a family know how much they were spending on Starbucks each month and they were kind of shocked by the, the number. So it's just good to sometimes, um, or maybe not so good, <laughs> but it's good to sometimes take a look and see what you're spending on different things, especially now in this economy. And it's also a good, when you have that picture from the list of how much your monthly expenses are, you can set up automated transfers into your checking account so that you never worry about overdrawing your account. And you also don't wanna keep a lot of extra money in your checking account in case someone gets a hold of your debit card or you know starts using your checks. Let's talk about documents and files and how to keep them. Um, you know, it's good to have a filing system. If you're keeping hard copies, do you have a file cabinet? Do you have a, an accordion folder? But some type of system and that you keep it up. If you let it go for months and you pile those papers up and three months down the line, it's time to file them all. That is so daunting. It's just too much. If you can take five, 10 minutes each week and file everything, it'll be a lot easier to do. Um, things that you can easily access online, like if they're coming to you also by email or your bank statements, you can go online and look up years worth of bank statements. There's really no reason to keep them in a file folder taking up space in your house. Ask your accountant how long you really need to hold on to things. Some of us think we need to keep things a lot longer than we actually do. And I would just make that as part of your, you know, conversation with your accountant once in a while, what you really need to keep. And I always say, when in doubt, throw it out, less is more. You can always get things over again. You can call a company and ask them to resend something. If you wanna do it digitally, um, there's several options. You can do it like in a Google Drive if you have Gmail. You can set up Dropbox. You can just set up, as I said, folders in your email. And then you don't have paper taking up space, especially if we are downsizing into smaller apartments, we might wanna um, not be taking up space with file cabinets. So you can make as many folders as you need when you do it digitally, and you can get really specific, have a file for, you know, make up vendors file and have a file for every specific vendor. So it's really easy to find. I invested in a decent scanner. It was about $150, I keep it on my desk. And things that come in the mail that I can't switch to getting them um, digitally, I throw them in my scanner and I put them into those digital files and throw them out. But it's really important to make sure those documents are backed up somehow in the cloud. Um, Dropbox is backed up. You don't really have to worry. The same with Google Drive. Um, but just make sure that you know that so that you don't lose everything. Just some more tips. I don't know if you've ever heard of the um, phrase, eat that frog, but that is go for your biggest item first. Sometimes you have a to-do list and there's something, a project that's a little daunting. It's gonna take you a while, um, get it done. It'll feel so good to know you have that out of the way. Sometimes I put those things off 
And when I finally do it, it's such a sense of relief. And I think to myself, why didn't I do that earlier? Really important passwords. Make sure that you're keeping your passwords somewhere really safe. There are digital ways to keep your passwords. There's something called Keeper. I use LastPass. Um, I have Keeper. And then um, One Password is another one that's popular. You can make yourself a spreadsheet to keep your passwords on, but you should password protect that spreadsheet and not forget what the password is. Um, you know, some people will keep it on a list of, you know, on a piece of paper in their desk drawer. Make sure it's somewhere really safe. Don't put it on your bulletin board. Don't put it on the back of your mouse pad. That's just too easy for someone to find. It's also really important to change your passwords, uh, you know, maybe at least every six months so that you know that somebody didn't get a hold of it in case somebody got a hold of it online. You're changing it up. Make sure you keep a folder for your tax documents, as I said before, and really keep track of your donations during the year. One thing we see often is that people tend to over donate because they're not keeping track. And you get so much mail for donations and you don't remember that you already gave to that charity, so you give again. And so I think it's really important to just keep track and go back and look at what you've already given. Keeping a planner, like your calendar and a to-do list is really helpful. I have an example of a digital to-do list. I make this as a spreadsheet and I just update it every day. Make those check boxes because it does feel really good to check off on your to-do list. And I have different columns for the different types of things that I do. So think about what works in your life. But some of those are more long-term things I need to get done. But uh, I then will move them onto the today and tomorrow list to know exactly like what things I have to do today. And that today and tomorrow list should not be very long. You should just have the vital things that absolutely need to get done right away on that list. You can do that on paper too. Um, each month you should really be reviewing your bank statements and your credit card statements to make sure there's no fraud or no subscriptions that you um, didn't realize you subscribed to or that you did the 30 day free trial and you forgot to cancel it. So make sure you're reviewing and that there's you know nothing on your statement that wasn't you. And then engage, as I said early on, engage with qualified professionals. You, you should have an accountant that you trust. You should have an attorney. Um, having a bookkeeper is a good idea and a good financial advisor is really important. Give yourself enough time to do all this. Schedule it into your calendar. Um, you know, they say, if you wanna make sure you work out regularly, put it in your calendar. It's the same thing with your finances. Make sure that you put time in your calendar to do this and try not to procrastinate and you know, be getting your taxes together on April 14th. Let's move on to talking about an emergency. Are you prepared? Um, you know, if something were to happen to you or you had a hospitalization and couldn't manage things for a little while, who would do this for you? And, and would they know what to do? Um, they need to know how to keep up with your bills. They might need to know your medical history and your medication information, your insurance. You wanna make sure nothing lapses. They probably need to provide Medicare information, insurance information. How can they pay your bills for you if you're doing online banking if they don't have access to your passwords? And by this, I mean a really trusted individual in your life that you would trust with this information. Um, you know, if the worst should happen to you, will people know who has your will? Um, the things that you have in trusts, do they know who, how to reach your attorney? Where do you keep things like the deeds to your, the titles for your automobiles, deeds for your home, things like that. Um, and then all your assets and accounts, will they, there's so many things that come up on the state list of unclaimed items. You don't want your stuff to be there. So we do something called our life and estate guide where this is actually like a 12 page document where we document all of these things and more that I just talked about. Like, where do you keep things in your home? Where is the key to your safety deposit box? All those kinds of things. You should really document that and keep it somewhere very safe. You don't necessarily have to put account numbers on here, but you should put how this person can find the account numbers. And it's just a gift to 
somebody who might have to reach out and help you, it will make things so much easier on them. And especially this will most likely be a very emotional time and stressful time and situation. So if you can help them, that's great. That's it for me. Um, as we said, we would open up for questions for either me or Lisa Joy. So I don't know if we have any. Any questions from the group? Hello, everyone. Let's stop my share. There's a lot of information. So um, you can feel free to reach out to either one of us anytime. I think we have some comfort, um, some um, great contact information for both. Um, if you need it again, feel free to contact uh, me at the Y. Sorry, we had technical difficulties earlier. The Zoom didn't want to open up anywhere at the Y today, but we got it working. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for listening. If it was yes. Helpful. And if you need our uh, in email information or phone number, again, um, you can uh, chat us before you leave the screen and we can pass that on to you or we can just put it in the chat. Yeah, go ahead and put it in the chat. Hmm. Any other questions from anyone? Thank you. Thank you. All right, this concludes our program for today. Uh, on behalf of the North Suburban YMCA and YES, I'd like to thank Lisa and Jackie for joining us today. Um, thank you for talking to us. Our next presentation is uh, Tuesday, November 15th at noon, uh, Happy Holidays or Hunger Games. So we'll be talking about diet and nutrition. Um, thank you today and thank you for my personal bookkeeper. And there's the information in the chat box. Thank you. Where is the podcast information again? So if that's we... on our website, nsymca.org. Um, I'm, sorry, yes. I'm sorry, the website would be under your personal website? The North Suburban YMCA's website, nsymca.org. Look okay. under YES and then right. look under the podcast. It'll be Thank there. you. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You, everyone. Have a good day, everybody. Thank, Thank you so much for listening. Much. Thank you. Bye.